Hey yo, what's up everyone? Welcome back to another video. It's your boy Jesse Keegan and your girl Fanny Longo and we are Fanny and Jesse. Jesse. So right about now we're gonna do another reaction video but before we get into the reaction guys I want to say thank you for subscribing to the channel. You guys are super amazing. We're on 20,000 subscribers. What do you think about that? It's a it's good amazing thing. Feeling. <clears throat> yeah, it's so a, you guys keep subscribing. Yeah, keep on subscribing. Make sure you give us some, you know, uh, good um, reaction in the comment section below if you want us to do anything. And for those who are new, we are finding Jesse. We do all kind of reaction videos. Just let us know in the comment section below what you want us to do, and we're gonna do it for you. So today we're gonna do another one, and this one was suggested by one of our fans in the comment section below. And they say that we should react to when they attack the Prophet. This is the story of Muhammad. So, without any further ado, guys, let's get it. How did they oppose the message? By many ways. Of them is they tried to convince Abu Talib, and then uh, they tried to block the da'wah indirectly, and then they had a showdown with Abu Talib. What else did they do in order to prevent the prophetic message from being uh, taught to others? Uh, the third thing that we'll mention is that they tried to ban the recitation of the Quran in public. They tried to make it that if the Quran were recited, they would drown it out with their voices or they would not even allow it to be recited. The fourth tactic was to ridicule the Prophet and the believers. Another tactic, the fifth tactic is false accusations, not just joking, but slander. The sixth point will mention, sometimes they try to challenge the Prophet ﷺ for a miracle. The seventh tactic that they did was attempts of a middle ground or attempts of outright bribery directly. The Jews understood who is a Prophet. The Arabs did not know who is a or what is a Prophet. And therefore, when the Arabs heard of this, that you are a Prophet of God, the only other nation that they knew who believed in Prophets were the Jews and Christians. And so they sent emissaries to the Jews. They sent emissaries to the people of the book in order to say, okay, this is a phenomenon that is from your religion. It's happening in our culture. So why don't you tell us something that we can quiz the Prophet with? We can try to ask the Prophet Wasallam. And obviously, because they thought he was a false Prophet, he was not going to be able to answer. So his lies will be exposed. So this was another tactic that they tried and they failed in this tactic as well. The ninth tactic that they used is outright torture. Now, as we said over and over again, the Arabs of old were a tribal society. Everything was based upon tribalism and therefore your protection is based upon who will protect you, not the law, not the government, but rather your own tribe. And therefore those who had tribal bonds, like the Prophet ﷺ, like Abu Bakr, like others, they were somewhat protected, somewhat. However, as we know, many of the earliest converts were from the slaves and the Mawali. Sayyid ibn Jubayr asked Ibn Abbas, was the torture really that bad? So Ibn Abbas responded that the believers were tortured in early Islam so severely and they were starved and they were deprived of water until they could not even sit up out of pain. They would have to be almost semi-conscious on the ground. And until one of them would be told, is Allah and Al-Uzza your God? And they would respond, yes, Allah is my God. Yes, Al-Uzza is my God, just to get rid of the torture. In fact, Ibn Abbas says, so much so that if an insect passed by them and they would have been asked, is this insect your God? they would have responded, yes, it is my God, just to get rid of that torture. The main culprit behind all of this torture was none other than uh, Abu Jahl. Now the question arises, what happened with the Prophet ﷺ himself? Did he undergo any physical torture? No doubt that the Quraysh overall and the Prophet ﷺ as well were relatively protected. But this does not mean that nothing happened to them. This does not mean that they were completely immune. Rather, we have a number of incidents in which the Prophet ﷺ was physically harmed uh, uh, eventually, of course, they talked about assassinating him and then they had multiple assassination attempts culminating in the grand assassination attempt that took place the night before the Hijrah. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His divine wisdom protected him. And sometimes for wisdom Allah knows he was not protected. There was a time when Abu Jahl, when Abu Jahl was boasting to his peers, to his colleagues in Quraysh. And Abu Jahl said to the people that I swear by Allah and Al-Uzza that if I see this man again 
one more time, the Prophet ﷺ, I am going to put my foot on his neck, meaning when he's in sajda, and I'm going to throw sand onto him. And the Prophet ﷺ came that day, Abu Hurairah narrated, and he started praying. And when the Prophet ﷺ went into sajda, Abu Jahl came forward, trying to or attempting to put his foot on the neck of the Prophet ﷺ. But before he got to him, the people around him saw that he turned backwards. He started walking backwards and he started pushing with his hands away and they couldn't see what was happening. And when he returned back, they said, what happened? What happened to your threat? Why did you walk away? We, we saw you putting your hand out. And so Abu Jahl said that I saw between me and him a pit of fire and there were wings hovering above that fire. When the Prophet ﷺ finished, he told the Muslims that this fire was brought by the angels. The wings were those of the angels. And had he taken one step closer, the angels would have shred him khiraqan khiraqa, to basically to bits and shreds. They would have shredded him into bits. It is also narrated, Urwa ibn Zubayr asked Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, tell me the worst thing that you saw happen to the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca. So Abdullah ibn Amr narrates what he saw. And he says, once the Prophet ﷺ was praying next to the Kaaba, when Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt came from behind him, and he took off his thawb, his garment, could have been like a type of uh, shawl, and he threw it around his neck, the Prophet ﷺ's neck, and began to choke him began to choke him. And the Prophet ﷺ was struggling with that choking and the people did not intervene at all. Until finally Abu Bakr was told that your companion is being tortured. And so he rushed to the masjid and he began beating up from behind now because now he is the Prophet is being choked from behind. And so he attacked Uqba and he said to him, rajulan an yaqula Rabbi Allah? Are you gonna kill a person just because he said, he says, my Lord is God, my Lord is Allah? And there are other examples of this nature where they physically uh, harmed him. Sometimes the harm was not physical, but rather emotional. So Ibn Mas'ud said that once the Prophet ﷺ was praying again in front of the Kaaba, when Abu Jahl and a group of his ilk, of his peers, were sitting around each other, and the day before a camel had just been sacrificed. So Abu Jahl said, Who amongst you will go to the carcass of that camel? In the there is a dump area outside Mecca. There's an area where you would throw your trash. So who will go to the, the carcass of that uh, camel? and bring the entrail, the intestine, the, 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 the guts, that which nobody's gonna eat, it's been thrown away. Bring that and throw it on the back of the Prophet of Muhammad when he is praying to his Lord. And so the worst of them, Ibn Mas'ud says, the worst of them, Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt, the one that we just mentioned, he goes to a dead carcass and he puts his hand inside this filthy decomposing body and he carries with his own two hands, entrails, blood, this, this disgusting, uh, sticky substance. And he comes from that yard, from that uh, lot, and he walks all the way into the city. And the Prophet is still praying because as we know, the Prophet prayer was long. He waited for him to go into sajda. The Prophet is unaware of what's happening behind him. And when he fell into sajda, then Uqba came and he dumped all of the stomach and the entrails and the intestine, this big, it's a camel, it's not a trivial animal, you know? And he dumped it all onto the head of the Prophet while he is in sajda. And all of it fell onto him and the weight of it was so heavy that he could not lift himself up. Ibn Mas'ud said, فَاسْتَضْحَكَ الْقَوْمِ The people began to laugh so hard that some of them had to fall onto their sides and others were hitting themselves. You know how they do when they laugh like this. And others were hitting themselves. And I was standing from a distance looking, but I had no way to help. I didn't have mun'a, meaning there was nobody that would have supported me. I am Ibn Mas'ud, these are Abu Jahl and whatnot. And the Prophet ﷺ remained sajid, remained in sajda until some persons went to tell Fatima, who at this time was probably around eight, nine years old, went to tell Fatima that your father needs your help. And so Fatima was a Juwaidiyah, was a little girl, Ibn, Ibn Mas'ud is saying. She was a little girl at the time and she began crying and running towards the Prophet ﷺ and helped him get this dead animal off of his back. And the Prophet ﷺ then stood up, he managed to stand up and he turned and he faced them. And he raised his finger up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when they saw him in this fashion, they became quiet. And he began making dua against them by name. Allahumma alayka bi Abi Jahl. 
Allahumma alayka bi uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. Allahumma alayka bi... And he mentioned every single one of them. And he mentioned each of them three times until all of them had a deadly pale in their faces. The blood drained from their face. And then Abu Mas'ud said, So I swear by the one who sent Muhammad with the truth that I myself saw every one of these seven dead in the battle of Badr. The first engagement, Allah took care of all of them. And eventually, of course, the matters got worse than this and talk began of uh, assassination. It is narrated in Ibn, Ibn Is Ishaq that once the news spread that they had planned to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. And a, a neighbor told Fatima, that uh, a lady neighbor told Fatima that, you know, they're talking about assassinating your father. And Fatima ran home and told the Prophet ﷺ that they're planning to assassinate you. And the Prophet ﷺ said, fear not, Allah Azza wa will take care of me. Bring me water. And so she brought him water. He did wudu. He made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he walked into the masjid. And they had their arms and they were ready to kill him. But not one of them could move. They all became paralyzed. They could not stand up. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took some sand and threw it at their faces while they're standing, while they're sitting and looking at him. And they were completely paralyzed. And he said, Shahatil wujuh. May these faces be uh, cursed. And in this riwayah as well, the Sahabi says, every one of these were of those who were killed in the battle of Badr. Uh, the last tactic that they did is the tactic of the boycott. And the boycott is its own topic that we're going to talk about. When the Sahaba reached around, we don't know an exact number, but roughly a ballpark figure around 20 or 30 of the Sahaba were present. The Prophet realized that he needed a place to congregate. Because there was, they couldn't do so in Mecca, in the, in the Kaaba, because it was too public. A lot of Muslims were secret Muslims. So the Prophet ﷺ decided to choose the house of, as you all know, Al-Arqam ibn Abil Arqam. And so Darul Arqam became the place where the Sahaba would meet. When did this happen? We don't have any year. But probably around, we would estimate around the, the middle of the third or the beginning of the fourth year. In other words, as soon as the da'wah went public, within a few months after that. Remember the da'wah went public after three years, right? After three years, when the da'wah becomes public, all of this persecution begins. The Prophet ﷺ needs a place, so he chooses the house of Al-Arqam. That was interesting to watch. What, what, I mean, what do you think? And <clears throat> religiously speaking, from a religious point of view, I feel like you can't mess with someone that's chosen. You know, yeah. no matter what you do, no matter how you embarrass them, shame them, not believe them, they're still going to carry on with their life. They're still going to uh, to be successful, and they're still going to uh, live on or move on in life. So I feel like you just play yourself by trying to harm someone. Do you understand? You try to provoke someone, they're not getting provoked. You do this, that mm. is still not affecting them. So you're just wasting your time and energy at the end of the day. What did you think? Yeah, so what you're saying is, is actually true. And to add, add on it, it's more like, uh, <clears throat> I mean, there are people out there you can play around with. But there are people that you can't mess with them. Not because uh they can just beat your ass down or whatnot but because they're highly protected by the uh <clears throat> by the guidance yeah. yeah the higher power you understand so that's why i mean it's it's um some people it's really hard to get some people it's really easy to get so how is it that these other people are hard to to get and these other ones are uh easy to get what's the thing that can be done for this person to also be like this one or is it that automatically chosen by the almighty or is it that you have to do something for you to become uh you know untouchable do you understand so that's the question you can ask yourself but uh i feel sometimes it's just you chosen you know i feel i feel like it's something that the almighty has seen in you and has given you a task to do, or maybe as I don't know. Or sometimes I feel like you can walk your way into that. Do you understand? But even if you're chosen, you also have to consider that not everything will be straightforward in life. Of course. These are the hardships maybe that's what, you're yeah. experiencing. Yeah, that's and what, other yeah. than that, 
it's just for people to discredit him as a prophet of God. And I'm saying like before you even get chosen, you have to go through something. I mean, the Almighty has to prove a point to you. I mean, has to get the green light to give you that, you know, uh, the, the, the power, you know. Not just, why well, just give him the power? Just like you, in class, or maybe people don't just, just give you scholarship because they just want to give it to you. They want to see how are you performing? You know, how good are you in the class? Did you get 4.0? Or you go 2.0 and then you want to give you scholarship. No, they want somebody who we can give and it can create um, maybe an impact to the society also. You understand? I think so. So the thing is, it's more like uh, the Almighty also looks at it like, okay, you know what? I'm going to give it to you, but you have to prove a point to me that and maybe he goes ahead and tests you here and there and there. So he sees how you 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 take those what do you call these <clears throat> those challenges how you're able to resist them how you're able to have the patience of waiting the wisdom how to maneuver your way in and out then from that point then probably gives it to you or something like that but again other than what we're just discussing right now i mean there's something that it's really hard for me to take in so now um these stories that we hear here i mean why is it that it's not happening in our real life why is it that the stories that we've just from listening to like the prophet was walking out and then the guys wanted to kill him and then he paralyzed them and they couldn't move why don't we see these things today? Why can't we be able to actually... Why don't we see those things with Muslims or what? Because with Christians, you know, the <laughs> what, what goes on. You no, understand? but still, even with Christians, we can't see people paralyzed. But like, it's a different time or in is life. It, I know it's a different time, but how possibly could that... We went from hunting from? and gathering or not living like that anymore. You believe that these things existed, yeah? Possible. It's possible. Even now they could exist. Depends on what you believe in in life. Why don't you think at least we could have been seeing this thing? This is like an example of churches. Give me a scenario. You watch those clips, what do you mean? No, those are clips, you know those are tempered I mean, I'm not talking about real life, man. Like you walk and then someone you see someone is wants to be killed and then he just does this and then people just stand understand i want to believe these things are there maybe not if not in this world maybe in a different world i but i mean at least let's but. let's see these things in real life situation you understand so that at least we 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 can even sit down and, and, and but then and, what you're doing is what these people are doing do you understand it's like challenging what Muhammad came with. So you're trying to challenge saying maybe this wasn't the case. I'm not trying to challenge, I just want no, to. No, I'm saying understand. it's like I'm not saying you're challenging, it's like you're questioning something. Okay. So for you to believe such a thing was possible, you would love to see it. Saying is believing, you know that. Okay. So it's fair, for, that's yeah, fair. For me to see something, it gives me uh, the proof that you need. Yeah, the proof, the know, you know, the knowing, you understand? Because we can live like this the whole of this life and someone giving you a story of what never we have in the past. Never know, yeah, never see such things happen. See. So, I, I don't know. Anyway, that was amazing. That was really amazing. Just let us know in the comment section what you think about the whole story. Or do you think this story is just uh, like a metaphors, maybe similes and all those kind of stuff? Just let us know in the comment section below. Or this is a story that really happened in real life situation where people stand still and like the Moses, the way Moses just divided the sea into halves and all this kind of stuff. Do you know the... that happened? I don't know. I can't tell. Because you were not there? Yes. I can't mm -hmm. tell. I wasn't there. So just let us know in the comment section below. What do you think or what's your belief in all the stories that are being told out there in the comment section below? Thank you so much. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up, share it with your friends and of course do not forget to subscribe and we'll see you in our next reaction video. Deuces.